Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah wa ahdahu wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiyya ba'dahu wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We praise him upon all conditions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy and we ask him to send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household, all his companions. May Allah bless them all and may he bless every one of us. My brothers and sisters, this evening we're not going to be having such a long session, inshallah, seeing that not only is it very warm and tomorrow is a Friday, but uh, I have a journey to make very early in the morning. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for us all. Uh, what I had in mind to speak about is something that affects me directly, and I'm sure it would affect every one of us. To start with, we all have lots of hope in the mercy of Allah. That's what we talk about. Every time we speak about having hope in the mercy of Allah and being positive and being a person who is always positive, who speaks to others with kindness, who protects himself or herself from pride and so on. However, what we need to understand is the hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should not lead us to transgress hoping in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because iman, al-iman bayn al-khawfi wal raja The true belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the correct balance between fear of the punishment of Allah or the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on one hand and the other hope in the mercy of Allah and hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if there is no balance, then obviously we're going to lose we become people who do anything. We keep transgressing, thinking that, you know what? Allah is ghafoorul rahim. Allah is merciful. Never mind, Allah will forgive me. Yes, Allah will forgive, but do not keep transgressing. There must come a time when we put an end to it. There must come a time when we make a change, when we can feel within ourselves that, you know what? Alhamdulillah, I have improved. And this is why a very important message for myself and for yourselves it is not a big deal to be superior to someone else. That's not my aim. My aim is not to be superior to you. And your aim should not be becoming superior to me. My aim should be becoming superior to the person I was. That's what it is. So when I become superior to who I was some time back, automatically I'm heading in the right direction. But if I lose against my own self, I've lost in a big way. If I become a worse person than I was, if I'm inferior to whom I was some time back, then obviously I've lost. But if I'm competing with you, then I've lost the plot because by right, I owe it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, the Quran does say, فَاسْتَبِقُ khayrat," which means compete with one another when it comes to doing good deeds. But all that should be to impress Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What should happen is, when it comes to good deeds, we should be motivated by the good deeds of others. Not to say that, you know what, I've told them, listen, I'm in competition with you. No. People do that in business. Sometimes a person, and this happens a lot, when we have businesses that are adjacent to one another or when we have businesses of a friend and someone else or a partner or a competitor. And we always say, I want to do better than this person. I wonder how much they've done. This is what's happening there. My business is, this is happening and that's happening. That's one of those things that must never make you lose focus upon the fact that we are heading to the Akhirah. All these business deals, two things are involved in them. One is, they are connected to this dunya and this world in the sense that whatever you earn from your business dealings will be able to benefit you in this world and in this world alone. But the second part of it is, throughout your business life, whilst you were doing your deals and working and earning and so on, every opportunity you got to do things upright would convert part of that deal into a deed or the bulk of it, if not all of it, into such a big deed that you could enter paradise solely by being an upright businessman. And this is why the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa where he speaks of At-tajiru al-sadduq al-aminu ma'an nabiyyina wa siddiqina wa shuhada'i wa salihin. He says a businessman who is sadduq and amin. What does that mean? Trustworthy or should I say uh, truthful, truthful and trustworthy. Like what we would say, honest and upright, shall be resurrected with the prophets and the martyrs and the high-ranking, pious people who are close to Allah. Because to be upright in business is not easy. If you can remain upright 
and you can take a knock where it is correct for you to take a knock just because you haven't cheated. Sometimes we are supposed to have taken a knock if we were upright, but there is a clause where we perhaps could cheat and con our way so that perhaps the loss is minimized or we don't suffer a loss. It's passed on to someone else. That's a carrot dangling. That's what it is. If we go to bite, we've lost. If we leave it, we've won. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. It is tailor-made by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Literally tailor-made by Allah. So He lets things happen in our lives in order for us to be tested. And this is why we say, while we are becoming better people, there will be things that will come in our path. There will be things that will come upon the path we are treading in order to test us. You've just given up these habits. Are you going to continue? Are you going to carry on? Here it is. It's coming and it's easier now. A person who perhaps has given up drugs for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just as we've given it up and everything is you know, clear and we're happy with ourselves, here comes someone with something better and cheaper. What's that for? Have you really given it up? Allahu Akbar. If we can turn away, we won. I've just given an example off the cuff. But obviously there are so many other examples like a person who gives up adultery. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for whatever sins we may be committing. But any sin, I'm just giving adultery or gambling or anything else, alcohol as an example. And as we've given up and we're now on the path and we're walking, here comes a golden opportunity that is unbelievable. Something that is dangling and it's something that will just let you feel inside that you know what? Let me think about it. No, we've given it up. It's quits. We're gone. We're on the right path. We're, no matter how easy it is from today, we're not going to do this thing. And what do we get as a result? And this is something that we should all benefit from. If I learn to abstain from prohibition for the sake of Allah. You know, the term taqwa is interpreted by some of the scholars such as Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani rahmatullahi alayhi and a few others. He says, taqwa is to create a barrier between you and the fire of Allah or the punishment of Allah. That is taqwa. So if someone asks you, what is taqwa? You say, to, to, to stay away from hell. That is taqwa. To be able to abstain. That is taqwa. Because it requires a lot of piety. And obviously, to, to obey the instructions is also staying away from hell. So if I am fulfilling my salah, I'm staying away from hell, it's taqwa. If I am uh, abstaining from prohibitions, I am staying away from hell, that is taqwa. So when we have stayed away, or when we stay away from that which is uh, earning the anger of Allah, we've become better people, something happens as a result. Listen to what Allah says in the Quran. Ya amanu oh you who believe if you develop your taqwa we will grant you the ability to distinguish we give you the intellect we give you the power of thinking properly, correctly. In tattaqullaha, if you are conscious of Allah, if you develop the taqwa of Allah, He will grant you al-furqan, the criterion. And here the mufassireen say it means the ability to distinguish between right and wrong. Something will tell you, hey, this deal is too good to be true, leave it. And sometime down the line, what happens? You, re you learn that the guy who got involved actually lost all his money. And you think to yourself, subhanallah, how did I just have a feeling that this thing is going to go wrong? It's because you abstain from the prohibitions of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah granted you a blessing in your business. He gave you the ability to distinguish. You just look at someone and in your heart you feel, hey, this person, I better be a little bit careful how I deal with them. You know, we all know, mashallah, some people you greet them and so on and it stops there. Some people you greet them and you can continue further. Some people you greet them, you can do business with them and mashallah, it will progress. And some people, nothing. You stay very far from them. If you cross their path, perhaps you might decide to greet them carefully. And after you've greeted them, if you've shaken their hands, like they say, you better count your fingers. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Obviously, it's just a saying. It, it, it means that the person perhaps has bad habits that are known. But how would you know? 
Sometimes a stranger comes to you and he comes to you with a lucrative deal and for some strange reason something somehow blocks you from it and you feel so good in your heart. But you know what, never mind, I lost whatever I lost, but so what. I'll give you another example. Say you are deciding to go for Salat al Jumu'ah, okay? And uh, suddenly a man comes in and it's time for Jumu'ah and he wants to do such a big deal with you. And he tells you, listen guy, I, I, I need, I'm catching a flight. And I need you to be here. And I need you. This is the deal. It's worth X amount. You have to. You have, if you have an option of doing the deal and missing the Jumu'ah or going for the Jumu'ah and missing the deal, trust me. In If you had the taqwa, you would say, brother, keep your deal. And I'm carrying on. Allahu Akbar. I'm carrying on. Or deal with my people. It's fine. It's fair. I mean, if you have a business, for example, that is being run by non-Muslims and so on, it's not uh, compulsory to close down your entire business during the time of Jumu'ah. All those whom Jumu'ah is incumbent upon and compulsory upon, they need to go for Jumu'ah and leave all forms of business because of the verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu idha nudiya lissalati min yawmil Jumu'ah fasa'u ila dhikri allahi wa dharul bayi'ah O oh, you who believe, who did he address? O oh, you who believe, when the caller calls out the call for Jumu'ah, then haste towards the remembrance of Allah and leave all business deals. That's an instruction of the Quran. Who did he address? O oh, you who believe. So what if there are non-believers who are there? The instruction is not for them. Their instruction is first to believe and then this thing will fall into place. So I, I've just uh, obviously diverted a little bit to explain the ruling. But going back to what I was saying, it is the taqwa, the, the consciousness of Allah, the piety, the fear of Allah, call it what you want, that which develops a gap or a distance between you and the punishment of Allah, that is what will help you to distinguish criterion furqanan. he will grant you the ability to differentiate so sometimes you have good and bad we can't differentiate sometimes we don't know our friends if they're good for us or bad because we think oh this guy's a cool guy you know he's always there and so on well he might be the worst company for you in terms of the akhirah because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about it even in the Quran where he addresses us and warns us regarding company and he tells us on that day the oppressor will be eating his hands the one who did wrong. A zalim also means a wrongdoer. The one who's done wrong. The one who's oppressed either himself or others or both. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He'll be eating his hands. What does eating his hands mean? It is a saying whereby the regret is depicted of the person whom it is mentioned about. So you say, that man's eating his hands in regret. So they literally eating their hands in regret that, Oh Allah, I should have taken the path that was shown to us by the messenger and I should have never had such and such a person as a friend of mine. He definitely led me astray after the guidance came to me. And shaitan is definitely a big deceiver. Big deceiver, he deceives man. So we need to know if your friend is taking you away from salah, well, you need to do something about it. You become the better of the two friends by taking them towards salah. And if you are becoming worse, cut it. Allahu Akbar. Cut that friendship. It's not a good friendship. It is something that only makes you laugh and joke and it does not remind you of Allah. Any friend that blocks your obedience is actually an enemy. Remember this. Any friend that blocks your obedience or discourages you from obeying Allah or encourages you to disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are actually your enemy. And what would happen to us if we have those type of friends, we would be included in this verse that is mentioned in Surah Al-Furqan. And this is not a coincidence. I spoke about Furqan a few minutes ago. Furqan actually means the criterion, the ability to distinguish the one who knows right from wrong, the one who knows right from wrong. 
The Quran is also called Al-Furqan. Why? Because it definitely makes clear what is right and what is wrong. And there is a path that we follow. And that path would definitely make us from amongst those who are upright. So what would happen? And this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has warned us about. If a person does not assist us to obey Allah's instruction, trust me, they need to be cut out. They need to be cut out completely. For example, if I have a partner, say he's a non-Muslim, I'm allowed to deal with non-Muslims. Subhanallah, they can be, you know, whoever they are, on condition that they do not transgress or make me transgress, disobey Allah's instruction, or forget the obedience that I am supposed to be engaging in regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If that is a person, say for example, someone comes into your shop. I'm giving you an example because people would understand it. If you have a shop, for example, where you're selling items to the public, someone walks in, you don't need to do a quick interview, right? What's your name? Do you drink? Do you smoke? No, 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 you don't. They'll come, they'll purchase the item, put the money down, walk out, and that's it. But we're talking about a friendship that you develop now between you and that person in a way that because of some reason, that friendship has developed. If that is going to take you away from Allah, don't think for a minute that Allah is merciful. He'll understand. You know, I was in a fix. What fix were you in? Subhanallah. It's like a person saying, no, don't worry, I'll do the deal and leave the Jumu'ah, but Allah will understand. What are you talking about? Allah will understand. Remember one thing, you can have the millions and the billions. I was reading an article on BBC on, on the... Uh, internet this evening and the news it says that the wealthy the wealthy in the western world there is a dip in their happiness in middle age what that means is when you're young and you're born into a happy home and so on uh, a wealthy home sorry very happy and you know they, 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 they obviously do not think of anything negative and after some time even if you have that wealth they dip I would like to think it's because of lack of belief. That's what it is. Lack of the link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The person's wealthy. They've got the dunya. But something somehow is missing. And they will come crashing sometime, someday. And they will realize, you know what? Well, I hope they realize. Allahu Akbar. May we be from amongst those who realize. This is a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes. That He tests us with things. The point I was raising is, if we do a deal at the wrong time, or if we have sold, for example, stolen goods, or for example, that which is prohibited, you know, there's a deal to be made, I need to transport alcohol, and I've got, for example, a transport company, and this alcohol from Harare to the other city, for, and they're going to give me a million bucks, and I think, you know what, I know it's haram, but Allah will understand, because I'm struggling here. The truth is, I should say, no matter how much it is, I will not do it, it's over. It's that carrot we spoke about a little bit earlier. Because we forget that it's not the figure that matters. It's the happiness, the barakah, the blessing. You will only achieve that through obeying Allah's instruction. A rida bil qalil. A mu'min is a person who's happy with a little. But he's happy, he knows I haven't transgressed against Allah. When a person is on his deathbed or her deathbed, that is when the thoughts start coming in. And you know, funny, I've asked this to quite a few people. Uh, when they are really, really ill and sick, and you know, sometimes they get better. May Allah grant shifa to all those who are sick and ill, may He grant them cure. I mean, uh, then you ask them, you know, when you were really down and you thought you were dying, because they tell you, I thought I was dying. Say, so if you thought you were dying, what were the thoughts going through your head? So now you hear different answers and it's interesting, I can share with you a few. Some people say, hey, I was thinking of all my sins and I was thinking of how, oh, what's going to happen now that I meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hey, you know, I'll probably be punished and probably this would happen and that will happen. And other people tell you, I was thinking of my good deeds and I was thinking of all the people and inshallah, I'm going to meet them in the akhirah and inshallah this and that. And you start thinking, hey, people think positive, people think negative and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ana inda dhanni abdi bi, Allahu Akbar. Allah says, I am going to treat every one of my worshippers the way he perceives me. Well, if you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to nail you, you'll probably be nailed. May Allah protect us. But if you have a hope in you to say, look, I tried my best and I know Allah is Ghafoor Rahim, have good thoughts. This is why for us, we believe it's the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa if you are in the presence of a person who perhaps is close to their death, the moment of death only Allah knows. But sometimes you can tell this person is nearing the end perhaps. Firstly, don't let an enemy of theirs walk through the door. 
You know, last minute you don't want words coming out of their mouths that are going to be derogatory. Secondly, you remind them of the good they've done. Tell them, MashaAllah, Allah bless you, Allah has had mercy on you. You might even want to use a tense that might not be extremely accurate, but to give them hope. Like for example, to say, you've sought forgiveness from Allah, inshallah he's forgiven you, and so on. And inshallah he has. We ask Allah to forgive us all. Amen. So you say, uh, you know, uh, all you do is uh, say the istighfar, say the shahada, say this. Uh, tell them good words because these are the words that keep you having hope in the mercy of Allah. Now that you are in your final moments, perhaps dying moments, you have no option. You have to have hope in the mercy of Allah. So just remember this inshallah for some time. If Allah gives us a, a good death by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the minimum is we have hope. We have good thoughts. We think about good things and the akhirah and how we will inshallah go to Jannah and meet up with Rasulullah sallallahu and the sahaba radiallahu anhum and perhaps the other anbiya and all. These type of thoughts are the thoughts of a believer. But if a person thinks that, hey, I'm going to go there and oh, you know what I did is, hey, that means that you haven't had that proper closure yet. You haven't yet cut it. You haven't yet made tawbah from it. Come on. It's about time. Allah's blessed you enough. We've had enough blessings. Let's move on and let's continue. This is why I started off by saying, never let that hope that you have in Allah's mercy make you sin. Because then you don't have an excuse. If you, the hope in Allah's mercy makes you sin, you don't have an excuse. But that hope needs to be there because we are weak, we are insan, we are inching forward, we are progressing, we are becoming better people every day, inshallah. And this is why I tell those who are not regular with their salah to become more and more regular. May Allah make us all regular with our salah. Once you are regular, start concentrating on the quality of the prayer quality so we con constantly improve constantly improve for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and trust me a day will come when we will go and when we go we will be in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may he make it easy for us on that day so one of the biggest things we achieve by t t abstaining from the prohibitions is the ability to distinguish between good and bad between uh, you know right and wrong and darkness and light and so on because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide those who are searching for the guidance one of the ways of searching for guidance is to fulfill the instructions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and constantly ask him now there is one more point that I'd like to make mention of before I open the floor for questions and that is do you know that when we consume that which is haram when we eat what is haram, automatically it affects our entire system, the whole system. So the thinking is being, if I can use the word, uh, energized by whatever you've nourished yourself with, which is haram. Your eyes are looking with whatever energy is required for that sight. Where did it get it from? Something that was haram. And haram here, we're not just talking about pig or you know haram meat in the sense that it hasn't been slaughtered properly but that which might be halal to eat but it was earned in a haram way we bought it through with funds that we got that were illegitimate so to speak or illegal or wrong so that too is considered haram and the process of cleansing it requires tawbah, it requires turning to Allah, and it requires, if it's usurped from someone, to return it to the person. And it requires a, a remorse and regret and a period of time. Sometimes, like for example, and this is something that people uh, misinterpret, where there is a narration which states that a person who drinks alcohol, his salah is not accepted for 40 days. And some people say, oh, I'm not praying. Why are you not praying? I mean, you're a man. There's no days in the month that you don't have to pray. Now, uh, yeah, I just drank last week, so still, I still got another 28 days left. Whoa, what are you talking about? That is foolish. That's an interpretation that is silly. Because you, the obligation of salah is upon you no matter what. It's upon you, okay? It's upon you. Now, if you have engaged in the... Or if you have consumed intoxicants in whatever way what would happen is the next 40 days the major spiritual achievement that you are meant to be getting from that prayer you won't be able to feel it and you won't have it because it, the payment is going towards what you have done 
It's a cleansing period. So you have to read your salah. So one is the fact that salah is compulsory. And if you leave it, you are sinful. That always remains. Two is the extra benefit that you are supposed to achieve from the fulfillment of that salah. That will happen depending on your concentration, depending on the quality of the salah, and depending on whether or not you have things to pay for. For example, if a person damages his vehicle, and his boss tells him, right, for the next 12 months I'm going to cut your salary because you've got to pay for the car. Does it mean, okay guys, I'm not coming to work for 12 months because my salary is going to go towards the car? No, you have to go to work. If you don't go to work, you lose your job, you'll be penalized. But when you go to work, the salary, you won't see it. But what will be happening? There will be some replenishing of some damage that has happened to something that was caused by you that needs 12 months for the payment. Similarly, the 40 days. I hope it's an example that's quite clear and we've understood it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. The reason why I raise this example is just to show that what we consume affects us. And what it does, it takes away the ability to distinguish. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ الرِّبَا لَا يَقُومُونَ إِلَّا كَمَا يَقُومُ الَّذِي يَتَخَبَّطُهُ الشَّيْطَانُ مِنَ الْمَسِّ this verse is connected to the consumption of usury and interest. And it's very important because it's either connected to the Akhirah or the dunya or it's connected to both, depending on the translation. I'm going to give you an interpretation connecting it to the dunya. When a person who consumes usury stands, they stand in such a way that it seems that they are affected by the shaitan. It seems that the jinn has affected them. They, it seems like they're mad because their consumption was wrong. They ate something bad, so Allah says their minds are also upside down. This is something, clear connection. So they'll speak something, but they won't know that this doesn't make sense. Not at all. You can have a degree, but it doesn't make sense. The reason is, what you are saying is completely incorrect. And this is why, if you look at sometimes, the trends in certain parts of the world are such that a man with a clear conscience and a man who is conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or a woman would immediately tell you this is absolute absurdity. Absurdity. Completely unacceptable. And then there will be people who have top degrees on a global level who are fighting for that item as though it is something that is supposed to be the norm. And you wonder, how can they not see the light? This is what it is. Their consumption is haram, so their minds are knocked. Totally. They can't think. They'll tell you, what's wrong with this? I, why can't I marry my cat? Why? You tell me. What's the problem? And you tell them, but what are you talking about? A cat is a cat. But what's wrong? Wallahi. And these debates are now on the globe. I'm giving you an example that the world disagrees with at the moment. But believe me, five more years, and it will be illegal to say what I just said now. Five more years. May Allah forgive us. Really, may He guide us and our children. And this is what's happening on a global level. It's something serious. People's brains are not totally, they'll tell you, but why do I have to do this? Yesterday I got an email from someone saying, but why is music haram? And so I decided to refer that person to a Christian. Allahu Akbar. How's that? A Christian priest whom I know who believes that it's totally prohibited because of how dirty it is and how bad it is. I answered them and I said, if you'd like further clarification from a different aspect from people of other faiths, here it is. That's what I did. The reason is, obviously there are people who say, oh, it's okay. And so in Islam, a door that leads to that which is prohibited is not allowed to be opened in the first place. That's what it is. Today, there are decent people, even atheists, and people who don't believe in anything, who are decent. They tell you, this music industry has become the lowest of the low. It's become so dirty that we are embarrassed to listen to that beat. I remember here, the TM that's now closed in Avondale. One day I walked in there, and I didn't realize that there was beat in the background. And some time later, I started... Suddenly there were dirty words that were being uttered. Literally swear words and words that I wouldn't use in my vocab. May Allah forgive us. And I heard this as though it's nothing, it's playing, and everyone's walking and everyone thing, and you know, some people are actually nodding their heads to the beat. And I'm thinking to myself, is this absurd? What is this? People who are so moral, they're supposed to be upright. And this country, mashallah, has got a standard that it's set, as you know. And I, subhanallah, believe me, to hear words like those are so embarrassing. 
I almost left what I was doing and walked out. But then I thought to myself, I've got the stuff in the trolley. Let me at least get to the till and carry on. But that's it. People see nothing wrong with it. And if you tell them, they say you're backward. You know, you're being too extreme. There's no extremism there. That's not extremism. That's just, be, it's my right. I'm just believing, look, this is dirty. Why is it that when the non-Muslims do the same thing, we don't call them, oh, these people are extreme? Because it's their right. If I want, I can believe that, listen, this is wrong. I don't, I don't do this and I don't want to be a part of it. It's like people who don't want to marry their cats. They, they're not extremists. They just don't want to marry their cats. That's it. It's a cat. It's over. Let, let cats for kittens and so on. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. But this is the world. So how did this come about? It came about because I was talking about consumption. And how when you eat that which is haram, your brain is not according to the Quran. Not meaning written off completely. Allahu Akbar. And sometimes when you talk to people, you can feel it. You talk to top people in terms of a brain of the dunya. A worldly, qualified, highly qualified brain. But they don't make sense. They are, they are fighting for a cause sometimes that is complete nonsense. It doesn't make sense at all to the mind that is believing or to a mind that is upright, to a mind that is concerned about the future generations. It doesn't make sense. But they are fighting the cause as though someone has cast a spell upon them. That's what the verse of the Quran says. Masjid shaitan actually also would refer to a spell or, you know, the way the devil has... Touched the person. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So this is why we, it's important for us to note that when we would like to achieve the ability to distinguish between right and wrong, we firstly need taqwa. And part of taqwa would also be consumption. To eat that which is halal, that which is pure. And this is why, and now I'm going to say something that I've actually confirmed with certain halal organizations and departments. This is why in a lot of what we eat, there is definitely a ploy and a plot to add ingredients that we believe are totally filthy. So there will be pig in something that pig, is not, pig doesn't need to be in. And we won't know and we say, mm, yum, it's like a man. You know, and we're busy consuming and excited and everyone saying this and you don't know what's going on. Well, the way we start thinking, you know, if a person has eaten haram, you want them to have halal thoughts? Simple. Person's consuming and they're not worried. You know, it's another thing if you tried your best and by mistake something happened and so on. Ah, that's another thing. But not bothered. That's why the hadith speaks about there will come a time when a man won't be worried. There will come a time when a person won't be worried whether he's eating from halal or haram. And trust me, I believe that time has already arrived. People are not bothered. They could not be bothered. They, they will eat interest calling it, hey, that's my prophet, I was witty. And for example, they will eat something haram saying, hey, these guys are getting excited and everything is haram according to them. Relax. Even if you are reduced to a vegetarian man, at least you know you've protected yourself. I mean, I was shocked going, reading articles that appeared last year about horse meat in Europe. Come on, what does horse meat have to do with beef and chicken? What does it have to do with that? And then I was shocked about pork, remnants of pork in chicken, chicken fillets, and there's pork in it. And then I found out how they're doing it, because obviously you've got, you got to see, you've got to look, you've got to check, you've got to search and hunt, and it's not so difficult nowadays with the net. And they've got a million needles that quickly go into the thing, and it, it, it swells up a bit, and what's there? Something cheap that's pork, and it's soft, and it goes in, and you think, mm, you know, that fillet was lack, I'm telling you. That juicy item, do you know that? Allahu Akbar. Do you know if it was halal or not? Come on. Allahu Akbar. May Allah forgive us. This is what's happening. So remember what we're eating. Please be careful. Please. You know, sometimes we all get a little bit irritated, myself included. When someone sends you a long list of e this and e that and so on. But what, all I'm saying is look into it. Ask someone who has knowledge. I mean, you have the, the brothers of the National Halal uh, Authority here in Zimbabwe, for example. And mashallah, here, yeah, right at our fingertips. We can ask them, hey, look, we've heard about this, this, this. And what is it? And we will get the information perhaps within a short space of time. Subhanallah. But it's up to us to consume halal. Wallahi, if we don't, we cannot expect to be able to know what's right and wrong in society, in community, in your home and everything else. Like for example, 
There was a young man who told me, hey, I'm addicted to porn, man. I don't know. I really, I ask Allah's forgiveness. I read my salah. I do as best as I can. But I don't know why. I just keep on going back to this thing. So, you know, there are so many ways of answering and trying and saying, look, make your salah regular. You know, your routine, need, this needs to happen. That's need to ha- that needs to happen. But when scholars get together and start talking, to each other as to how each one has dealt with different situations. Wallahi, it helps. And one of the things I've learned is check the person's consumption. Where do you work? What do you eat? How do you eat? And so on. Do you read your dua? You know, there's little supplication before eating. Wallahi, it's important. It ensures that what goes in, inshallah, it will be utilized in a correct way. You get energy. You know, when you eat things, you get energy. And that energy is going to be utilized in a certain way. Let it be halal. If you read your dua, there is a greater likelihood. If it was halal and you went out of your way to make sure it's halal going in, then this is what we call halal and tayyiban. It is halal and tayyib at the same time. Pure, clean, good, nice. You've eaten it and mashallah, your thoughts are clean. But if a person consumes haram, and I found the youngster later on, that subhanallah, he was not bothered about his consumption, eating anything. You know, one of those people who just goes around and thinks, okay, for as long as it's not pork, it's okay. Then what do you expect? Your, your energies will drive you towards doing something haram. Now, if you become conscious of it, your mind is occupied with something. Allahu Akbar. And, and, and you, when you consume, the energy that comes in is blessed. You say, Alhamdulillah alladhi at'amani. Or at least, Alhamdulillah, praise be to Allah. Alhamdulillah alladhi at'amani hadha at-ta'ama wa razaqanihi min ghayri hawlim minni wa la quwa. I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I thank Him for what He's given me and He's blessed me with without any of my energy. You know, I've done nothing and here I am, I've just eaten. Look at this. All I did was I probably paid something and next thing it's in my mouth. And what did I do? Nothing. I owe that praise and gratitude to Allah. So this is what it is. Let's make sure inshallah that what we consume is halal. Inshallah what we... Uh, earn inshallah being halal and remember one thing my brothers and sisters engage in lots and lots of istighfar on a daily basis that, that's advice to myself and then to everyone else ask Allah's forgiveness every day ask him forgiveness a hundred times and more every day every day because one of the days we're going to die if we die on that day and we've already asked Allah on that day to forgive us about a hundred times trust me you cannot die without a smile May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us to Jannah. May He make us not from amongst those who have false hope. And I spoke about it today. May He make us from those who have the correct hope and who can work towards earning that mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala Muhammad.